are going to get started uh, with uh, uh, policies and intro to autom automation, uh, the first session up here uh, of the JNOC. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Michael from Floating Orchard. Uh, Michael and I have worked together for a long time. Floating Orchard has been a partner of JAMPS for four or five years now, uh, quite a long time. And what we wanted to do is, uh, you know, with the JNUC, we've always had the, the really, really technical sessions, but we've also always tried to incorporate some for, for anyone who's new to Casper uh, or new to the Casper suite or uh, evaluating the product or, or just kind of wants a little bit more info on some of the, the kind of core features that we have. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to let uh, Michael take over and go from there. Thanks, Cam. Hi, everyone. Oh, thank you. Uh, two things. First of all, um, I did mandate that Stonehenge must have been built here for me. However, it's not to spec, Cam. Next. Yeah, also, it must be a, a gauntlet for me. So I'm just going to say right now, if I fall down into this thing, I saw it coming. All right, so uh, policies. I love policies. Um, that's me. First thing I want to know, just because uh, this is an intro course, so uh, my goal at the outset is to give somebody who has never touched a policy before in their lives the most basic information that they need to know in order to make a successful policy. It's not a lot, uh, and, and so for those of you who are thinking, oh, I've, I've already made a policy, that's okay. We'll, we'll throw in information there that, um, that will be helpful as well. Um, but a lot of the stuff that I've written uh, in, the, in the keynote um, are, are like keywords that I think if you write them down, because uh, you've never built a policy before, and you refer back to them later, hopefully they should help you. In the meantime, I'm going to be saying a lot of stuff over that. So for those of you who are, say, maybe more intermediate or advanced, hopefully uh, that will be helpful as well. Um, but to kind of tailor this, especially as we move towards the end where we're going to have a q and I'd, I'd just like to get a sense of who's in the audience. So how many people here are from education? Yes, thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah, OK. So we're going to do education stuff. Business. All right, yeah, business represent. Um, government, anyone? NGOs, anyone? You guys, like, you never even get your own sector, but I don't even see anyone raising their hand, so they didn't show. Um, all right, great. And, and then with respect to level of expertise, how many people here would say they're beginners? Okay, all right. Intermediate, you've built policies before, you want to get better at it. Okay, cool. How about advanced? Anyone here? You are advanced. What are you doing here, guys? Come on. <laughs> no, we'll, uh, we'll, try and, <laughs> we'll try and get some good advanced stuff in there as well. Okay, uh, slogan. So uh, back when I first met Cam, and I guess that was 2010, um, the, the uh, select few jamps that there were uh, had these two slogans. The first one was, anytime you find yourself doing the same thing over and over to your max, the Casper Suite can automate that for you. It's kind of a big promise. Anyone who's had to walk around to max just like software update, software update, software update, that's a big, that's a big promise. Second thing, oh, which one did I point this? The Casper Suite will give you back your nights and weekends. Part of that is because you're not doing the same thing over and over uh, manually, but it's also because uh, Casper has the ability to schedule tasks for you. Both of these promises are fundamentally delivered by policies. We could have a side discussion about other things that deliver these promises, but fundamentally, policies are what automate things in your environment, and they're also what allow you to schedule those things. So you say, oh, we need to do a big update tonight. I'm going to do that while I'm at home playing with my kids, and then I get an email notification if there's something going wrong, and yeah, I pull out my phone, something like that. Okay, so uh, for this presentation, we are going to start by covering architecture. The architecture of policies is super important in understanding uh, how they can be leveraged in your environment predictably. You, it, it allows you to trust policies. Um, and that's because the, the architecture of the Casper suite and the way that policies interact there uh, is, is totally unique. We're going to talk about policy basics. This is the, the like one, two, three, what do you need to know when you're building your first policy? We're going to talk about user impact. This is super important because now that we're not walking up to our end users' workstations individually and saying, OK, do you mind if I sit down and do this thing? Or maybe they're on the phone, do you mind if I Apple remote desktop into your device? Uh, we need to be careful about how we're impacting our users so we're not, say, installing software updates in the middle of a lecture. Uh, we're going to talk about fully automated policies, the most exciting part of policies. I love these things. We're not going to have enough time to, to really delve in deeply to them. But knowing that they at least uh, exist, that the potential is there for you, uh, is, a, uh, is a gift unto itself. We're talking about pitfalls, because uh, 
I, I recently looked up this quote, with great power comes great responsibility. I thought that that was something really deep, but it's actually just Spider-Man. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then we'll uh, hopefully have time for Q&A. And I guess my goal at the end is to, is to maybe get a little bit more feedback on specific pressure points or uh, challenges that you guys have, and, and we can talk through, at least strategically, whether or not policies are the solution for you. All right, uh, OS X management architecture. When I first started doing Apple Enterprise uh, Systems Administration uh, 10 years ago, that was me and that iMac, and those were my users. I had 700 users. All of them were in their own little fiefdoms. Anyone who works for a public university probably knows what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and I had to interact with them uh, somewhat individually. Uh, the network architecture of that looked like this. It was me sitting in front of my computer, and I pulled up Apple Remote Desktop, and I was like, oh, I need to you know, fix something for someone. And then my computer, oh, there's a laser. My computer seeks those devices, right? So if I have to do the same thing to multiple different people, those people need to be available. What happens when they're not available? Now I've got a, a scope of, say, 50 computers that I need to update. 40 are there. What about the other 10? Now I'm spending time trying to mop this up. Uh, it gets messy. Time for a new model. The new model is your devices seek your management solution. So we install an agent, a Casper agent, also known as the Jamf binary. Uh, on each of these devices, and those devices call home to the JSS. This establishes connection on a regular basis so that all we have to do is intercept that call home with some instructions. And there's you making changes to the JSS um, on your own time, but the work actually happens separately from that. Network level simplicity. The OS X Jamf binary schedules system tax, tasks on enrolled computers. Now, the reason that I'm, I'm emphasizing OS X here is that iOS doesn't look anything like this. So if you're here to learn about iOS, actually, you may want to go check out a different session. Um, but this is great, because we, uh, we become administrators to install the Jamf binary. It uh, creates these system registrations for us, and that's what calls home to the JSS. Computers seek the JSS host name. This is how they find your devices, or your, your JSS. It's really simple. There's an address, right? Anyone who has a JSS, you know what that master URL is because you've been told never change it. Uh, and, uh, and it uses really simple technologies, DNS, HTTPS. In fact, the only thing that's a little, little unique about how Casper handles that is that it uses a custom port. Beyond that, DNS and HTTPS is basically the way the internet, wor internet works right now. So, um, so it's pretty dependable. Uh, and then once that connection is established, the JSS responds with instructions to the client. So client calls out to the JSS, do you have anything for me to do? JSS says, no, I don't. That's fine. The client will come back later. Um, but if there is something to do, the JSS hands off those instructions, the clients perform work, and they, uh, and they get work done. So they log the results to the JSS, and that's ultimately what we keep track of at the end. So policy basics, simple things that you need to know. Uh-oh, I just inserted a user impact preface here. This is because you should start by thinking about your users. It's the most important part of policies. So who are we? We are nerds. Who are they? They are users. <laughs> we are the horse. They are the cart. This is not a chicken or egg dilemma. There's no ambiguity about whether or not we're here for them or they're here for us. They need to get work done. We have jobs so that they can get their work done. The better experience we hand off to our end users, uh, the better everyone and happier everyone will be. So just remember that as you're, as, you, as you're about to create your first policy, think, how will this impact my end users? OK, now we'll actually handle policy basics. This is what policies look like in Casper version 9. It's, it's different than uh, 8.7. And uh, how many people here are still on Casper version 8? OK, all right. How many here are on 9? OK, how many have ever seen, have never seen a policy interface before? This is totally new for you. Just a couple. OK, great, excellent. All right, so in, in Casper 9, things look a little differently. We have, a, we have some nice uh, user interface improvements. So for example, we, can, we get uh, collapsible uh, categories. Um, uh, the one policy created by default in every new Casper installation is the update inventory policy. This is how we keep the inventory in your JSS accurate so that we know the state of the clients uh, uh, out in the field. Uh, you can see the plan for this one. All it does is just run this update inventory task. And you also notice the three most important parameters over here, frequency, trigger, and scope. We're going to talk a lot about those. <coughs> This is what uh, a, a new policy interface looks like when you, when you start. You can see that we, we have the opportunity to name the policy, check the box uh, automatically, it's, it's enabled. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, 
we have our payload. So uh, Jamf has done a really awesome job of mimicking the rest of the, the Apple condoned uh, user interface specification. Uh, so as we create a policy, we just add payloads to that policy, and ultimately that's what performs work. The three most important parameters, events. So uh, another way of talking about events in Casper version 8 was uh, triggers. Um, triggers are still accurate, though there seems to be some kind of shift heading towards uh, events. So, um, so that's why I used events. Scope and frequency. Setting these parameters at the outset of your policy is almost imperative to building a good policy. Yes, you can set them later, but if you're not starting by thinking about those three parameters when you're creating a policy, I think you're probably doing something wrong. I like to think of them as a triangle. They work as a team together. And understanding how changes to that triangle uh, uh, impact your, your clients is, uh, is really essential to, uh, to understanding how policies work uh, at their most fundamental level. So let's talk about events. Events, also known as triggers. Events initiate policies on your client. You should be thinking, how do I want to kick off the policy from the client side? Uh, they originate from enrolled computers. So we have to get a client into inventory in order for, uh, in order for events to, to be even possible. And in the triangle, it just kind of looks like that. An event starts and heads towards scope. At the network level, it kind of looks like that. A client calls home to the JSS. I'm going to do a bunch of this kind of repetition. We'll see the triangle a lot. We'll see the network diagram a lot, just so if you're red, it's resonating uh, with you one way or another, um, it'll be consistent. OK, and uh, when we're choosing events, uh, this, is the, this is the simple event uh, interface now within the JSS. And you can see uh, all of our choices for events. Startup, when a computer turns on, it will talk to the JSS if it has a, uh, an internet connection. When a user logs in, when a user logs out, these are all user, typically user-initiated actions. Uh, so they're, they're performing uh, some kind of action on their end, uh, and that's what we're going to, to use as the, the trigger to kick off the policy. We also have some new things in Casper 9, actually really exciting things. Network state change, this, uh, this also was called the system configuration trigger. Basically, it just listens to uh, network interfaces on your computer, uh, and let's say I turn on my Wi-Fi, it can kick off a policy, and let's say I work in an environment where we don't, we don't want to have Wi-Fi uh, and Ethernet operating at the same time, it can say, oh, they just turned on their Wi-Fi, therefore we're going to disable their Ethernet. Oh, they just disconnected from Wi-Fi, we're going to turn their Ethernet back on, that kind of thing. So that's a new event. Uh, enrollment complete, for anybody who's doing thin imaging in their environment where uh, they, want, they want to say, okay, as soon as you get enrolled, I have this series of tasks that needs to happen to your client so that you, uh, you comply with our, uh, our own internal policies. Um, that's what enrollment complete is for. And then the recurring check-in. The recurring check-in is the most frequently used trigger or event uh, that you will use uh, when you're building your policies. That's because it's happening over and over and over. OK, next we're talking about scope. Scope determines computer eligibility. So I have this work that needs to be performed. That work gets performed on computers, right? Therefore, which computers are eligible to receive this policy? A scope can be static or dynamic. What that means is that I can say, oh, I have this subset of computers here, this department uh, that I need to perform this work on over and over, or just once, versus dynamic, meaning I'm not entirely sure which computers in my environment specifically need this policy, but I know that something about them, or they need what this policy offers, so I'm going to try and, and make their eligibility determined by that criteria, and we'll get into that more later. Lastly, scope filters computer inventory records, and those devices must be managed in your environment. So if the computer's not in inventory yet, it's not going to be within uh, the, the realm of scope. And that's what that looks like at the triangle level. So if you get past scope, you're uh, on to frequency. In Casper version 9, scopes look a lot different. Um, it used to be that we just basically had targets. And I could say, uh, I can either deploy something to a computer, a computer group, uh, a building, or a department. Uh, now we, we actually break it up, and there's targets, limitations, and exclusions. So targets is which computers do I want to be eligible. Limitations is within that subset, uh, I only want, for example, people within a specific IP range. If you're inside my network, then do it. But if you're outside my network, don't do it. Uh, and exclusions, which would be like, oh, I need everyone in the math department to get this piece of software, except Teacher Smith. Teacher Smith doesn't want that piece of software. So I can just create a simple exclusion within my scope and say, Teacher Smith no longer gets that policy. And at a network level, basically, we have all of our devices that are calling home to our JSS all the time. Do you have anything for me to do? And then Scope says, well, when these particular computers show up, then I, I want you to perform this policy. 
All right, and lastly, frequency. Frequency limits policy execution. This is maybe the most misunderstood part of policies. People tend to think of, uh, of frequency as being a persistent state. I want something to be like this all the time. That is not how policies work. Frequency limits the policy execution. So if I have this event happening over and over and over again, I need to actually limit that and say, when, wh which of those events that occurs do I want uh, to kick off my policy? It is the master control for policy recurrence. And you can think of frequency as being the throttle, because you'll find that as you're building policies that maintain your environment for you, it can be more aggressive, meaning like do it immediately the next time, or it could be say something that happens, oh, I'll check on it once a week, and if, if it's changed, then I'm going to change it back, something like that. All right, so frequency isn't just a continuation, it's actually a gate. And I, I thought about trying to animate a gate, and I didn't. So anyway, imagine that being a gate that just opens and closes as the frequency applies. When we're choosing frequencies uh, in our Casper 9 policies, this is under the general tab. It's not prominently displayed, and, uh, and as, you, as, you, as it becomes second nature, that's not an issue, but I felt compelled to point it out. It's within the general tab, and you actually have to scroll down. The default choice is once per computer. Why? Because most of the work that we want to do to our clients, we do it once, and we're done. For things that are more regularly recurring, we, uh, we have once per user, so let's say I have multiple users on the same device. I can say I, I need to make this change to each person's home folder, so I'm just going to do it once every time they log in, versus scheduled things, such as every day, every week, every month. The, the every week and every month are really popular for things like software updates or verifying startup disks, doing the little maintenance tasks that just keep, keep your clients uh, humming along. And then lastly, ongoing. We're going to spend more time with, with talking about uh, how, how important ongoing is. But you can imagine, for example, I have my users uh, log in. And every time they log in, if they're inside my network, I want them to mount this shared drive. And this shared drive is not tied to Active Directory or anything like that, but I just want them to log in, have that drive pop up. That's an example of pairing uh, a login trigger or event with an ongoing frequency, because I want it to happen every time. And that's what that looks like at the network level. So these computers are calling home. They are eligible within the scope. And as long as my frequency is not limiting them, the policy will, uh, will proceed. And this is what that policy procedure looks like. So I'm building my policy. I'm cho choosing my event scope and frequency. What policies actually do is they perform work. What do we mean by perform work? Work is the actual changes that you want to make to the clients. Work can be apps. I want to install Microsoft Office. I want to install Firefox. I want to upgrade Office. I want to upgrade Firefox. I want to install Flash. I want to install a Java update. It could be printers. So I have all my network printers in my environment, and I want to, uh, I want to use policies to, to make everyone have the printers they're supposed to have. We perform maintenance. I just mentioned verifying startup disks. Any scripts that you have, and there's a lot of great scripts out in Jamf Nation. We'll talk a little bit about that later. This is what the actual payloads interface looks like. So um, in Casper version 8, it didn't look like this at all. Uh, you, you had uh, tabs along the top that said packages, uh, printers. Now it's actually nice and GUI friendly. Um, and you can see, for example, the restart options here is configured, right? So it's telling us whether or not the payload is actively in use versus uh, these other ones that either don't contain anything or just say not configured. So that's really helpful as I'm, if, as I'm scanning through a policy. I quickly get to see what this policy uh, is doing, what kind of work it's performing. All right, and then after the client performs the policy procedure, it submits a log back to the JSS. Now, this, this kind of uh, client calling home, talking to the JSS, getting instructions, performing that work on the client side, the client's totally responsible for that work, and when it's done, then it tells the JSS how it went. This is a lot different than kind of actively watching over the client, seeing how things are going. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that at all. Um, if you use the Casper Remote tool, Casper Remote gives you a little bit of that kind of uh, real-time functionality, but policies don't. So we just basically have to wait for the client to tell us uh, how the policy proceeded. So computers submit logs of work performed along with any relevant errors, which is how we, we check how well our policy is, uh, is doing. Um, they respect Unix-style exit codes. For those of you in the intermediate or advanced level, anyone who's built a policy already that pushes out a script, scripts, when properly commented, will throw a proper exit code. So if they exit with zero, Exit zero means everything went fine. Exit of one or higher means there was an error, uh, and it's our responsibility to figure out what that error was. 
this is what that looks like in the Casper 9 interface. So uh, I look and uh, view all the computers that have run a policy. This one is just running startup disk. Uh, and you can see just a very simple plan. Uh, and, it, and it didn't feed, indeed uh, pass that verification. You also notice on the right-hand side, we have uh, a flush button. Flush tells the JSS to forget that that client ran that policy. So that if a client is eligible, thinking about a triangle again, the next event, if it's still within scope and it now no longer has run that policy, even if it's run once per computer, it's forgotten that it ran that once uh, and, the, and the policy would execute again. All right, so here are some example policies. Run Apple software updates monthly. Um, this is a really easy one, right? Um, Apple releases updates. We, perhaps we have an internal Apple software update server. Perhaps we don't. Uh, but just making sure that the clients are getting whatever patches they need from Apple. Um, often, uh, well, for example, in schools, it's very popular to have the kids take their laptops home. If, they're, if your uh, kids can reach the JSS from their home, they can all run Apple software update at home. And that way, they don't come into school and clog your WAN bandwidth uh, just trying to run Apple software update. Install Office updates in sequence. Currently, uh, in Microsoft Office 2011, you have to go from, this is just version 14, you have to go from 14.0 to 14.1 before you can go to 14.3.7. So it's two hops. And, and in the Apple world, that's kind of an anathema. We just run software update and it just goes. All right, so, so in order to get those updates to install properly and ensure that no uh, device that, or, or computer that doesn't need that update uh, gets an attempted install, we work with policies to make sure that, that only the computers that need that particular update get that. And it can happen in sequence. So I image a computer, for example, with version 14. It gets 14, uh, version 14.1. Once we see it has version 14.1, it can get 14.3.7. Reimaging computer labs nightly, just to clean, clean things off. And that can even happen locally without pulling, uh, pulling um, uh, operating system images off of your distribution point. Resetting forgotten passwords. Uh, I, I actually put this in uh, last week. Helping end users upgrade themselves from OS X or to OS X Mavericks without admin privileges. Or you could just do what we saw at the keynote, and that would be, uh, be even easier. All right. Uh, User impact tool. So, so let's, let's revisit this Apple software update uh, example policy. When I'm thinking about when and how I want Apple software updates to operate, I have scheduling choices. So I could say, well, school runs from 8 AM until 3 PM, so don't do it there. Teachers are there an hour early. They're an hour later, so don't do it then either. Let's, let's, uh, let's schedule it for after 8 PM. It's also really helpful to talk to your users when you're, when you're making these kind of decisions. I encourage people who've never had policies in their environment before to, to uh, sit down and write, uh, write just a simple document that explains, we have a window where we are going to perform work on your computers. And this is the type of work you can expect. And this is the type of symptoms. And we're going to have an agreement so that I'm not going to run software updates on you uh, when you're teaching, but you also can't try and prevent my policies from running when they're supposed to. So really, really simple way to, to meet your users. Notifications, I get to let them know what's going on. And this has gotten even more powerful in 9. It used to be that you could like display a message. Now we can display messages at very key junctures in a policy execution. We have a deferral option. So let's say, let's say your environment is not that you, you can't organize it. Classes happen all the time. There's just no way. There's now the option to say, hey, we're about to run this policy on you. Is now a good time? And if it's not, they just say, no, not now, and, they, and go about their merry way. Uh, there's also the ability to set a maximum deferral time on that. So we could say, all right, well, I'll give you four hours. But after that, you, you do actually have to run the policy. And lastly, self-service. And honestly, guys, we're not going to go really deeply into self-service. There's some great uh, presentations happening this week uh, on self-service. So I would encourage you, after you've digested the basics here, go check that out, because that's definitely its own beast. Um, but self-service is a great way of saying, instead of telling you you have to do it now, you know that it's there. When you need to do it, just go to self-service uh, and kick it off manually. All right, this is what the new user interaction interface looks like in Casper 9. So we start with a start message, right? This could say something more aggressive, but keeping it pretty light and casual. If now is a good time, click Continue. If not, just choose a delay that works for you. Uh, and then I set a, set a deferral option until Valentine's Day, just to stay on their sweet spot. Uh, we, have, we have a complete message, uh, which just lets them know that, that whatever work was happening, let's say their computer was slowing down a little bit, uh, we, can, uh, we can just let them know it's done. Maybe I upgraded Office. Now it's OK to start using Microsoft Office again. Uh, and lastly, uh, a restart message. And this is actually the, the same message functionality that's in Casper version 8. So um, the, the message dialogue in, in Casper 8 um, 
uh, has this default text that says your computer will restart in five minutes, and then there was a little checkbox next to it that said, oh, well, show this message even if I'm not rebooting. And that was the way of getting a very simple notification. Now, I would argue that that's uh, largely been supplanted by the complete message, and we, uh, and we can use a restart message um, differently. OK, so simple policies. On an event, when a computer's within scope, we're going to perform some work. Usually that happens once per computer. If you need Office, install Office, and then be done. Fully automated policies are, are different than that. Fully automated policies allow me to tell Casper about problematic conditions that exist in my environment. And this is getting back to the idea of, I don't know specifically which computers, in my brain, I don't know which computers have this problem, but I know the problem exists out there. Uh, and what I wanted to do is fix that problem whenever it's found, even if it's happening over and over to the same computers. They require a dynamic scope call this a criteria-based scope. So you're, you're a member of my group because you meet this condition. They require a reoccurring event or frequency. And by reoccurring, I mean we can't just say, run this policy once and be done with it, because if that problem reappears on that same computer, my policy that only runs once per computer is not going to re-execute that policy, right? So the goal is, no, I do want you to re-execute that policy, but only when the computer needs it. To get the dynamic scope, we use smart groups. Smart groups are my second favorite feature in the Casper suite because their membership is defined by criteria. They are criteria-based collections of inventory records. And what that looks like in very simple kind of code logic is, if this condition is true, whatever that is, then be a member of my smart group. So if you need a Java update, not that anyone needs that, uh, then, then be a member of my group, right? And it's always, the answer is always be a member of my group. That's all smart groups do. This is what the smart group policy interface looks like. So we have criteria. If you have keynote.app and your application version is not like version 5.3, which happens to be the latest version now, then be a member of my group. I would then pair this with a policy. For just like um, right now, general poll, is this information new information for you? Am I re-saying things that you guys feel you already know? Or uh, yeah. Who, who, for who, who is this new information for? Some people. OK. All right. Good to know. All right. So looking back at our triangle, the real difference here is that we're swapping out a criteria-based scope. It allows a client to enter into that scope and then leave that scope when it's done. Computers float into membership of the smart group. The paired policy takes effect. The computer performs that work. I'm updating Java. And when it's done, it updates its inventory. This is not, an, this is not something that, that happens um, without our interaction. We actually have to tell clients to, to update their inventory. But they basically log the results, and then they also say, all right, well, now here's the current state of my computer. Um, and that should record a successful Java upgrade. On that inventory change, once that arrives in the JSS, the smart group membership changes. If you needed Keynote version 5.3 in order to get that policy, now you've got Keynote 5.3. You're not a member of my group anymore, so the policy will no longer take effect. And I started using these uh, dotted blue lines as a, as a dynamic scope. So computer talks to the JSS, gets some work to perform. It updates Java, submits the inventory, floats out of membership of the group. So the next time it checks in, it is no longer within scope. That update inventory piece, it lives under the man, uh, maintenance tab. Uh, when you add a maintenance payload, it automatically checks update inventory for you. This is super important because what we're going to get into next is pitfalls. Smart group membership depends on accurate computer records. And if you are making management or policy-based changes to your clients, your inventory must reflect those changes. At its most basic, if I created a policy that said, once per computer, next time they check in, I want you to install Microsoft Office, that policy would execute. But my inventory record, unless I told the computer to update its inventory, would not show as having Microsoft Office in inventory. That needs to be added as a separate payload. All right, pitfalls. This is what I refer to as the Bermuda Triangle of policies. If you create one, bad things will happen. Planes will crash. <laughs> Try and keep it light in a nerd conference. Uh, <laughs> all right, so this is what a Bermuda Triangle of Policies looks like. Notice that I have a static scope. Before, we were just talking about criteria-based scopes, right? Nope, I just swapped it back for a static scope. 
paired with an ongoing frequency, which you, if you remember back in that tab, we had once per computer, once per user, once per day, week, month, or ongoing. Ongoing is opening up the throttle, saying, I don't care, just do it, keep doing it. All right, and notice that there's also a reoccurring event. So as opposed to when my computers start up, I want to do this every time they start up, a recurring event such as our, our periodic check-in, which is by default, checks in every 15 minutes. Theoretically, what I'm saying is, if I use our, our reoccurring uh, event, every 15 minutes to all these computers, whoever's in scope, all the time, do this work. Who can, just, as, is anyone doing anything to all their computers every 15 minutes all the time? Anyone? No, right? No. Oh, I, oh, I got a hand in the back. Yes, sir. <laughs> what do you do to your computers every 15 minutes? You inventory them? Um, do not do that. <laughs> Absolutely do not do that. Uh, you, will, you will have a 100 gigabyte database in no time, uh, and it's a total pain in the butt. So yeah, do it once a day. <laughs> uh, that's why I asked. All right. Uh, OK, so then, um, so basically, yeah, what happens is uh, 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 with a Bermuda Triangle, I've got all these computers checking, in my, uh, checking into my JSS. The, the biggest Bermuda Triangle you can create is all your computers. In fact, the next time you're going into scope and you're choosing a little drop down that says, I want to specify computers, or no, I think I just want to do it to all my computers. The Bermuda Triangle of policies is talking to you right now. Are you sure you want to do that? It's much better to define a scope that potentially includes all of the computers in inventory, but isn't just saying, all of my computers in inventory. There's a nice smart group created by default called All Managed Clients, just for that. So all of these computers in my inventory calling out to my JSS, all of them are eligible. None of them have the ability to escape. So they're just going to do it all the time. Much better would be to pair it with a criteria-based group, a smart group. So as long as I do that, then even though these clients are calling and checking in with the JSS all the time, perhaps we're saying on an ongoing basis, every 15 minutes, but only if you're in my dynamic scope of computers, perform that work so that after that work is done and my policy is working properly, you will float out of membership of that group and you will no longer get the policy. All right, advanced policies. So just little things to chat about. Uh, Pairing extension attributes with scripts to, to solve custom problems. Who here in the audience is already doing this? Got a few people. OK, this, this is, maybe it's not K2, but it might be Everest. K2 is harder than Everest, right? It's really big. The API would be K2. Whenever you're in your environment and you're thinking to yourself, I have this problem, and I know all of my, my clients have it, or a bunch of my clients have it. I'm not sure who. but. I can't see within the Casper interface, in the JSS, I'm looking through inventory records, I don't see where this problem exists. A simple example is network time server. How many people run an internal time server in their environment? A bunch of people. How many people are running some kind of directory-based authentication on their clients, Active Directory, Open Directory? OK, cool. For all the people who raised their hand the second time, but not the first time, you need this policy. Because when you're doing Kerberos-based authentication, it's really important that the clocks on your servers and on your clients match. And anyone who has had that go into a mismatch has been in a world of pain, and you don't make that mistake twice. So do yourselves a favor. Set a network time server on all your clients. In the Casper interface, there is no GUI checkbox that says set time server right now. Instead, you go to Jamf Nation. There is a set network time server script that's been around for years. It still works. It's great. Uh, so so we, can, we can push out a script that will set that time server. But how do I know which clients don't have the proper time server at the outset? The answer is an extension attribute. Extension attributes are scripts that run during an inventory collection. So they're not policy-based scripts. We don't, we don't push the scripts out. But every time a computer refreshes its inventory record in the JSS, an extension attribute can run. And, and one of those extension attributes that's also free is show me the network time server. So building this into our fully automated policy, I can say if my criteria is any client that needs this network time server float into membership of this group, I can pair that with an aggressive policy that says I want that to immediately take effect on the next check-in, execute my script to set that time server, and when I'm done, I update my inventory so that the network time server value on the client shows up in the JSS. Once it's there, my smart group membership changes, the client floats out of membership of my smart group, and now it's escaped the policy. Now, why does it matter that, that that's fully automated? Well, if I'm giving my kids admin access to their systems, they can do all sorts of things. Not bad stuff, they just can just check things, change things, right? So if my kids are like, oh, time server, no, I like using this other thing, you're like, oh, that's, that's great, but no, <laughs> we're not gonna let you do that. <laughs> it's too important. 
All right, so that's so so network time server is a, is a great example of how Casper is extensible. Uh, we're we're not force fed a list of checkboxes or, or a GUI interface that says you have to do it our way. There's no update Firefox button that just happens and I'm not involved. Instead, it says. You tell me the types of information that you care about tracking. If it's not already in Casper, it can be. Uh, and we'll also give you the tool set so that when those problematic uh, custom conditions exist, you can also fix them with Casper. There's a lot of good information shared on Jamf Nation. Usually when people sort of head down the policy path, they're thinking, I got this problem, I got to fix it. Go to Jamf Nation. See who else is fixing it. A lot of people uh, are talking about uh, good stuff there. And they also talk about when the best time to run things are. Like, oh, this is really something that you want to run at login or logout, which normally I wouldn't want to do because when my users log in, I don't want to slow them down. I just want them to log in and get their work done. And then script with custom triggers. This is, yeah. Uh, is anyone here scripting with custom triggers right now? Oh, yeah. What are you guys doing in this? <laughs> Why are you here? Uh, scripting with custom triggers. Um, let's say I have uh, a post-imaging workflow that I need things to happen in a very specific order in, in order for, uh, in order for the, um, the client to be properly configured. Instead of depending on uh, uh, Casper's GUI to, to initiate that workflow, I can write a simple script that just says uh, from the command line, sudo jamf policy hyphen event my custom event one. sudo jamf policy event my custom event too. And basically, that script will then just call those specific policies in the appropriate order uh, and get your work done for you. All right, Q&A. So anyone have any questions, any challenges? You're wondering, is this something policies should be doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or they'll send me an email saying, I can't get to this Flash website. I'll be honest, I've probably done a thousand other things. I haven't checked Flash or Java or had a website that I called on it. So I'll get it, and then all of a sudden, boom, got to drop what I'm doing and get Flash and Java out to people, because if not, that, that's one of about 200 people. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, anyone else have that challenge? Flash and Java, yeah, anyone? All right, yeah, OK. Uh, all right, so the first thing is figuring out when the application is actually released, right? Which, when it's a really aggressive schedule like Java, that's its own challenge. But once you know that that challenge exists, um, a simple way uh, is, uh, is the Casper Suite can inventory plugins by default. Uh, and that's where Java and Flash both live. So you can just take a look at the version of Java being used there. Um, there are also other people who have uh, even stronger opinions about the best way to track which version of Java you're using. And there's great information on Jamf Nation about, uh, for example, a little extension attribute you can add that tracks it the way that you want it. Um, how are we doing on time, Cam? OK, we, yeah, we're great. Oh, yeah, it's almost 11, almost lunch. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, the, the, uh, with, with Java and Flash, I, in my experience, the, the most seamless way to deploy that for your users is to repackage it using the Composer tool. And one of the great, great things it gives you is the ability to turn off automatic updating, which it, unless your users are admins themselves, they just see this dialogue and they can't do anything about it. So uh, I would encourage you to do that too. Other challenges? Yes, sir. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. Um, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. OK, the question is, uh, I want to do selective inventory of my environment. If you remember the, the default screenshot um, when, you, when you first installed JSS is there's an update inventory policy that just runs once a week to update your inventory. So uh, this gentleman's question is, what if I don't want to run update inventory on all my computers all at the same time, or I want to be selective which inventory items I'm swapping out? The answer is yes, you can. Um, and and the, the start by looking uh, in the Jamf binary. Anyone who's running uh, a, a OS 10 computer right now that is managed by a Casper suite somewhere, if you open the terminal and you type jamf help, you will see the jamf binary and all of its beautiful verbs. And one of those is uh, recon. And if you type jamf help recon, it's going to show you all the different parameters that you can 
feed to that policy. And so you could say like, oh, just show me who the, the current user that's logged in is and update that field in inventory, but nothing else. So yes, it is possible. Other questions? Yes, sir. some sort of a preemptive check that there's something else maybe that the policy or I can't do within the smart group or something very specific. Is there some way for me to maybe take and uh, pass the status of it so if it doesn't reach the criteria of my uh, uh, preemptive script that it can cancel the policy and run it? Uh. Well, yes, and, and actually you can build that into the, um, well, it w wouldn't prevent the policy from running, but you would, it would escape the, the script um, and, and result in, the, in a positive value. So you could say like, oh, well, even though this condition wasn't met, still exit zero so that I don't get an error from it. It's just that I didn't need to proceed with the script. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not positive that if you want us to chat uh, outside later, I, we could talk more about it. Uh, other challenges? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I would flush if it failed and it would rerun. But there's some cases where we're using uh, a little more echoey. We want, to, we want to step through and see if any one of those failed. And so the result was that successful installs still show red. Yes. Thank you. I was hoping you were going to say that. OK. So and when we sit on top of a policy environment, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry, guys. All right, the, the, essentially, the, the question is, what happens when I'm creating a policy, and at the end of that policy, I'm getting the result that I want on the client? In, in his case, Creative Suite is showing up, and it works. However, at the end of that policy, Casper's telling me I got an error on that, so then I have a mismatch. This is, this is something that gets into making sure you're working through policies in stages. And the stages I recommend start with the build stage. The build stage is the anything can happen stage. I'm an engineer. I'm going to see a lot of failures. I'm going to see a lot of errors. What I want to do is I want to fine tune that process until I'm getting somewhat of a predictable outcome in my test environment. Next, I move into pilot. I'm going to test this workflow that I've just spent all this time fine tuning on a very subset, small subset of production computers. If they're behaving well in there, then I want to unleash it into the rest of my environment. What's really important about that is that the most frustrated I ever see customers is when they think that build is the same as deploy. And they, and they say to themselves, oh, but I, I built the package and I pushed it out and I got all these errors, what am I doing? And my first question is, well, did you test it, right? Uh, did you deal with those errors that you were getting before you actually de deployed it to the rest of your clients? So try and, try and uh, embody that mentality. Um, I did actually just see the same issue, though, with Firewall. If anyone here has used the, the, the Firewall script, um, it's available on Jamf Nation. It starts with a turn off the firewall and then turn it back on. And if the firewall is already off, it throws an error and it says, oh, error one, the firewall is off. But then I turn the firewall on and it's back. And it's just fine, right? But it still get this exit error code of one. So, uh, so commenting out the script so that it doesn't try and unload uh, your, uh, your existing firewall launch agent would then be a way to, to get just a positive result. That's a good question. I, that's usually where customers start tying their scripts that they're deploying back into uh, extension attribute behaviors so that the policy runs. And then your script spits out, oh, it's like this or it's like that. And that's recorded on the client. At the end, we update inventory. It pulls that information back into inventory. So I'm tracking the specific result of that script as, a, as a, its own inventory record. We're, I think we'll take one more question. And then I think, is it lunchtime almost? Lunch is 11.15. 
I'll, I'll stick around and keep answering questions, but I just don't want to keep people captive here. So. Yeah, because we're, we're doing the two lunches. So if, I mean, if you want to hang out in here and, and chat some more, we can do that. Um, otherwise, there's lunch right up here, too. So we can just keep going. Great. It's just a quick related question to that, actually. Uh, for when it determines that a, a policy has failed, does it do it based on the return code, like the exit code? OK. Yep. Yes. Yep. Oh, and, and one, one related note on that. When a policy fails, it does not automatically say, oh, well, you're eligible for that policy again, because it didn't operate the way that I wanted it to operate. That's not the way it works. It will, wh whether it succeeds or fails, it only operates once per computer, once per user, whatever. And it's up to you guys to fine tune what feeds a client back into scope. Oh. Is there a way to do um, like read receipts for policies? To read receipts? For yeah, or, or create receipts for each policy that gets applied? Sure, yeah. You could do it your own way, or um, you could even you could create um, dummy packages. Actually, Miles, uh, talk to Miles. He's the inventor of the dummy package. Good question. Yes, sir. So you're about, uh, yeah, feel free to filter out, guys, if you're, if you're done. 